This moment, this moment right here, this is what sets the DC Animated Universe apart from almost every adaptation of the beloved DC Comics characters, or really any other superhero adaptation. If you're unfamiliar, this is a scene from the pilot episode of Batman Beyond. This sequel television show takes place in Gotham 50 years after the events of Batman the Animated Series. It shows an old haggard Bruce Wayne using a technologically advanced bat suit in order to stop criminals. And yet his body just isn't up to the challenge. Despite having a heart attack, he's attempting to do the right thing, but in doing so, he's forced to cross the one line that he swore he never would, picks up a gun. This moment is brilliant character writing. Batman ends the same way he began. Would they? Well, you already know. See, guns are antithetical to Bruce Wayne. His monastic devotion to protecting the innocent from the evils of the night have evolved to the point where he has a strict moral code, a visual iconography, and only two real lines he won't cross. No killing, no guns. And all of that is broken in this moment, and we the audience know it instantly. This is something none of the live action versions of Batman have ever truly gotten correct. But, also, none of those adaptations had Bruce Timm, Eric Radamski, Stan Berkowitz, and Paul Dini at the helm. But we'll, we'll get back to that. If you're unaware, the DC Animated Universe is a series of shows and films interconnected in a shared continuity. Sounds like a familiar concept now, but in the 90s, it was, well, it was unique. The DCAU started on September 5th, 1992, with the premiere of Batman the Animated Series. Believe it or not, it lasted all the way up until May 13th, 2006, with the cancellation of Justice League Unlimited. If you're not familiar with the inner workings of that timeline, it's pretty simple. The animated series, Superman the Animated Series, New Adventures of Batman and Robin, Batman Beyond, Zeta Project, Static Shock, Justice League, and Justice League Unlimited. All there. It also included the feature films Mask of the Phantasm, Batman and Mr. Free Sub-Zero, Mystery of the Batwoman, Superman Brainiac Attacks, and Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. If that's a lot to remember, don't worry, you don't need to. This interconnected tapestry of films and shows produced one of the most intricate and well-crafted superhero universes ever put to screen, and it did it a solid decade before the idea of producing an interconnected cinematic universe was a fashionable thought. Because all this reminds you of something, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, the DCAU kind of feels like the MCU or the Arrowverse, but also distinctly doesn't feel like the DCEU. Simply put, the DCAU should have been the blueprint for both the MCU, but more importantly, the DCEU. What makes it even more frustrating is that Warner Bros. easily could have hired the minds behind the animated universe to shepherd DC Cinematic Universe into existence to help mold, well, what they've already molded in the past. They just chose not to. So let's delve a little deeper. Let's examine what is so great about the DCAU, what common attributes that it shares with the MCU and the DCU, and also where it can all go wrong. Let's see what DC Cinematic Universe maybe should have done differently. Okay, so if you're familiar with the history of comics, you know that both the Marvel and DC Universe were constructed bit by bit organically. Action Comics number 1 and Detective Comics number 27 didn't originally take place in the same world. And we're gonna need a little granular here, so bear with me. After national publications saw what was working, they leaned more into the idea of caped characters and eventually put all of their caped characters together on a team. Same thing with Marvel. Stan and Jack had been creating comics for Timely, aka Marvel, for a long time prior to 1962's Fantastic Four number one. But after they started working on that project, the success began more success, and the Marvel Universe ballooned out from there. So let's smash cut 30-ish years or so later, and the DCAU literally functioned the same. There was no plan to make a universe out of Batman the Animated Show. It was just so successful that new and interesting opportunities to tell stories kept popping up, and the creators took advantage of them. The MCU was built much the same way. The idea of an interconnected tapestry of franchises began for Marvel after former Toy Biz exec and low-key mastermind behind most of the Marvel's subsequent film and television adaptations procured the rights to Iron Man. Marvel decided to launch a film studio, adapting their own intellectual property into feature films. Off the backs of the success of Fox's X-Men series and Sony's Spider-Man franchises, you know, the Sam Raimi ones, and they followed through. The first two outings for the fledgling cinematic universe would be in the summer of 08, Iron Man with RDJ and The Hulk with Edward Norton. Both these films were solid origin films. They were intended to set the characters up for continuing adventures, and well, in one case, they succeeded. <laughs> After the resounding success of Iron Man and the weird pseudo-not-failure of Hulk, Marvel Studios announced on May 5th, 2008, a plan to produce a Captain America movie, a Thor movie, Iron Man 2, all of which would interconnect and lead up to an Avengers film. Which, if you look at it, is very similar to the structure of the DCAU, which, again, decade earlier. Start with the individual pieces, organically grow them, and let them become something bigger, like, well, Justice League Unlimited. Across the street at Warner Brothers, however, DC Comics... Uh, 
things were a bit rocky. After the undisputed success of the MCU, WB decided that they needed their own cinematic universe off the ground. However, even like they were behind the eight ball, they didn't follow the model that both the DCAU had pioneered and didn't want to appear as they were mimicking the MCU. So instead, they took the opposite approach. Big team movies, then spin-offs out of it. The Launchpad film was going to be called Justice League Mortal. That's right, the first DC Universe film was going to be called Justice League Mortal. It would have depicted the titular Big Seven coming together to stop fast food tycoon and mind control enthusiast Maxwell Lord from taking over the Earth. Then, an interconnected web of solo superhero outings would have spun out of that film. So the inverse of the way this should work. The product was going to be reacted by Bad Max's George Miller. However, despite getting pretty far along in pre-production and having a whole film cast and being ready to shoot in Australia, the product was shelved at the last minute due to the financial crisis. DC then pivoted to attempt to follow the Marvel model. Well, things don't always go as planned. The idea was a solo Superman film. The film would share the title with a long and gestation sequel to Brian Singer's Superman Returns, but would be helmed by Zack Snyder. Well, the film ended up coming out and was a modic success at the box office, but it was by no means a runaway smash hit on the level of any of the MCU films. As such, WB executives did what executives do best and panicked and decided they needed to pull out the big guns immediately. They didn't have time to wait for establishing all the solo characters in their own films and, you know, building character. They needed to get to the highly recognizable intellectual property front and center. This would lead to rushed and poorly conceived versions of Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, which is a loose adaptation of both The Dark Knight Returns and Death of Superman, a heavily re-edited Suicide Squad, and, well, you know, now Justice League. We all know what happened there. They would eventually go on to produce Aquaman, Shazam, Wonder Woman, and Birds of Prey. So now that we have an overview of the MCU contrasted against the constantly readjusting DCEU, let's break down why Warner didn't follow the template of what they had already accomplished literally over the past 15 years prior. Remember this, the Batman holding the gun moment? That moment tells you everything you need to know about Batman. And it shows you him at the end of his arc, which is a key distinction because Batman Beyond is about passing on the mantle to the next generation. Everything Bruce Tim, Eric Adamski, and the other DCAU stalwarts did took these key details as the starting points for these characters, something the MCU has in spades. And to be clear, every MCU movie isn't great. The MCU in general isn't necessarily amazing. But structurally speaking, it's hard to argue that the MCU didn't get something right. Do I love every MCU film? Not even close. But what I do know is that they understood what it meant to create their universe. Sometimes their jokey banter makes these characters feel kind of samey. But underneath all of that, they get what makes the various characters tick on a bone deep level. Again, for the most part. Now look at the way Eric Radamski constructed the look and feel of Batman the Animated Series. All the backgrounds of the show were drawn on black paper, so that it felt like the shadows were the primary attribute Gotham had. That aesthetic choice flows directly from the character of Bruce Wayne. The fact that the governing style was dark deco, meaning gothic art deco, also comes from Batman's history. He's a character that's been around forever, and yet he's timeless, just like the aesthetic of the show. There's computers and phones, and yet zeppelins and old-timey radios. The world of the show is built around Batman. The show comes from his character. Same thing from the Superman show. It's bold and bright and it's reminiscent of the Fleischer Brother cartoons. But still contemporary and modern. It's timeless and iconic. Tim Daly, the voice of Superman in the show, is so perfectly cast that an entire generation of people hear him in their head when they read Superman comics. They didn't try to make Superman grim or morally gray. They didn't try to update him for the 90s. They made him a perfect distillation of everything that had worked before. So let's juxtapose that with Man of Steel. And it doesn't really learn those lessons, does it? To look at another reasonable distillation of this, MCU Cap versus DCEU Superman. They're two sides of the same coin. Warners was concerned that Superman would appear hokey or out of step with the times, and so they let Snyder run with a darker, more conflicted Superman and Man of Steel. In many ways, they had lost confidence in their ability of their man out of time to connect with modern audiences because his morality was something from a bygone era, in their opinion. Which is exactly what Marvel chose to do with Steve Rogers and people loved. That's what they keyed in on with Steve Rogers. That's what made Captain America work understanding the tonality of your character and building that tonality from inside the character, not crashing that tonality onto them. Ultimately, the fact that Joy McDuffie, Bruce Timm, Stan Berkowitz, and Baldini were literally employees of Warner while all this was going on is exceedingly frustrating because this tonality is something they understood down to their core. 
And this tonality is exactly what has driven the separation between DC movies and Marvel movies, and arguably exactly what has made the Marvel movies more successful than the DC movies. Tonal consistency and tonal understanding. The right people for the job were right there, even if they had just been the executive producers guiding things along the way. They certainly understood these characters better than, well, maybe Zack Snyder. And that's not a shot of Zack Snyder, he's an incredible visual filmmaker. But being a good filmmaker does not give you the expertise that these men who built these worlds, these iconic worlds, had. So why weren't they involved? Well, a few reasons. Politics, money, and vision being the primary ones. However, the more important aspect of this is that they weren't ever even in the conversation because animation isn't thought of as culturally important in the same way live action film is, or television. Animation is for children, live action is for adults. The heads of the WB wanted high profile directors and writers, despite some of them not being massive fans of the source material. The Justice League Unlimited Season 2 finale epilogue is one of the best Batman stories ever told. If you need any convincing that the DCAU team would have knocked this out of the park, this should be the front and center example. But alas, it wasn't meant to be, and honestly, it doesn't matter because the DCAU still exists and is fantastic. Well guys, that's it for today's episode of Nerdstalgic. As always, if you enjoyed this video, press that like button. And on your screen right now should be two more episodes of Nerdstalgic, so you can stay right here and check those out, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.